I am Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. All right, everybody. Here we are, West Point, Mississippi. And I look across the couch, and we've got a guy who grew up not too far from yeah, here. Yeah, Tom Bigby Riverbottom. Tom, right. Beckby. Tom, Tom Beckby. Beckby. Tom Beckby. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Tom Beckby, did y'all see that jacket? That oh, my goodness. That stuff Bobby awesome. Luss over that wax cotton. I he loves what, it. Was it's it about time jacket? somebody did a yeah. bottomland wax cotton jacket. It's some great looking oh, we, stuff. Oh, there's some out there. There's a couple of them it's out the there. It's the best looking one I've it's seen. It's a good one. Yep. Yeah. 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 It's awesome stuff. It really is. Pilsen did them. Shen did them. You need to get a discount code, You need man. a sample, though. Yeah. 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 Maybe we can give one away as a prize to somebody on the yeah. on the podcast. But they are great, though. I would encourage people to go check them Good out. Good looking. What well, do you get for the man who has everything? Well, you get him a wax mossy oak bottomland wax cotton jacket. Tom Beckby, yeah. Bobby Cole. Make a note over there. I would love that. I would love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You. Well, so our guest. Uh, is, we have another guest that's observing us. Uh, we have an observer observing today. you. And uh, yeah, and this young man, uh, is Josh Walters, is the reason I'm taking dancing lessons. Oh, tonight. how are those going? I wouldn't tonight's have told the first one. Tonight's the first one. I wouldn't one. have told that, brother yeah, William. Well, we what might. What kind of dancing are you going to specialize in? I think swing dance. Swing. You're going to be a swinger. Swing dance. I, I think there's a big difference. There. Maybe maybe you can do that at the, the blues night this weekend. I can't right? wait to see your skills. Man. Yeah. I'm, okay. yeah, buddy. I'm glad you let us know what yeah. we'll have those video cameras yeah. out. Can we yeah. come tonight? No. no. <laughs> that is not open to the yeah. Richie, we should go. Yeah, we're, we're definitely sending Rob on that. It looks oh, yeah, like yeah. He, he looks a little embarrassed of. He's hiding behind his hand. He over probably there. is. I don't think he's got anything. <laughs> if else he's to not do embarrassed, that. he will be <laughs> sooner or later. <laughs> yeah. right? sure. He's going to learn not to stand close to you and catch shrapnel. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, looking on our guest couch, Pierce Young, uh, you grew up in Columbus, if right I'm not here. Mistaken. That's yeah. right, yeah. and yeah. somehow fell in love with wildlife. Oh yeah, it went to Mississippi hard. State. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, bulldog. Us, tell us a little about. bit about how did you get into all this? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I I grew up like a lot of people did, you know, going with my dad and granddad, you know, as as probably as soon as I could walk, uh, hunting. Like you said, I mean, not I mean, we were right on the Tom Bigby hunting club. Uh, my dad and granddad were in, spent a lot of uh, Christmas and and birthday money coming over here to West Point and. And spending in the Mossy Oak store. Oh, we appreciate Booyah. that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, me too. Keeping us employed. So I, I it's still open, by the way, if you get each, you know, credit card. <laughs> help yourself. I might have to go over there after this. <clears throat> but, uh, but yeah, so uh, from there, um, loved, loved it, especially deer hunting. I've, I've hunted just about anything you can in Mississippi um, at one point or, or another. And, um, and then... Met a wildlife biologist. Y'all know him, William McKinley. Oh, yeah. um, he was our DMAP biologist for our hunting club, and and I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and and uh, and you did it. Yeah, and I did it. There yeah, you that's what. That's road. how you do it in life. You make up your mind and you just go do it. That's, that's right. Great. Good. A lot for to you. be said for that. Yeah. Yes. So your title right now is uh, assistant coordinator of the wildlife private lands program for mdwfp that sounds like yeah. a big title that is a big yeah. title. It's a long title it's a lot of stuff to do 2022 <laughs> he was the biologist of the year for the state hit the horns year. hit the yeah. horns yeah i was yeah it's boom it's rare to find a wildlife nerd that is also good at school and he has <laughs> he has both come he, on dudley i mean well you kind of got to. i mean I, I always i never you, you're comparing I, yourself you're right. just because right. you are a super <laughs> yeah. tree nerd that wasn't good There's school. Doesn't, guys doesn't mean you can't, school he's got it all that's right yeah, you mean you can't do it. he's bona fide i have been right. surrounded by a lot of good uh wildlife biologists uh in my short career already and through school yeah, bona fide so. and sanctified too yeah. so. well so we want to talk about deer habitat things you guys ought to be doing right now problems that you see opportunities that you see but one of the things i want to ask you right out of the gate and we've never you know we've done 250 episodes and we've never discussed this at all but i saw a recent post that you did about a month ago that really impressed me and it was about for goodness sake if you see a fawn laying there don't pick it up no yeah. yes it, it, please don't. that was a great post very yeah. timely 
Yeah, it. Uh, I mean, this time of year, you know, especially right now uh, in central Mississippi, a bunch of them are hitting the ground. We get a bunch of phone calls. Um, a lot of people, you know, think they're abandoned, and and they're not. Uh, and and so if if you do pick them up and take them away, the, the chances of them actually surviving go down. Um, so it's best if you if you pick it up. Um, just put it back, you know, in the woods or somewhere close by. Mama's nearby. By. She usually is going to stay about a hundred yards away. Um, that, I mean, that's her, their defense mechanism. The, the the fawn doesn't have a lot of scent. Um, tip, I mean, those spots on the fawn, you know, mimic like the light coming down through through vegetation. So, mm. so if you can put that fawn in some vegetation, it'll be just fine. Um, but Mama stays away because that coyote or or whatever can find mama a lot easier than that fawn so just leave them alone so i, I wanted to ask you hear you. that mom <laughs> when when uh that fawn is born does the mama then get it up and take it away from that spot so that they're all and then how does that how does she communicate how does that she lays it somewhere mm-hmm. and that and that little fawn knows to stay right there Yes. I mean, uh, they can walk. I mean, I, I worked at the MSU deer lab, uh, at the, the research pens for Dr. Damaris there. And we had a lot of fawns and it was, it was pretty cool to watch, you know, during that time. Um, they'll, they'll drop the fawn, uh, typically clean them up, eat the umbilical cord, you know, to get that, that extra protein. And then they'll kind of move them somewhere where, where there's more vegetation. And then, uh, and then that fawn, I mean, can can literally walk almost as, as soon as it's born. Um, and then we'll stay there. Uh, and then every about four to six hours, she'll come, kind of give a little bleat. Uh, or if that fawn starts, really uh, most of the time that fawn will start bleating a little bit and let mama know to, to come uh, that, that it's hungry. So she'll come feed it, move it to another new spot and, uh, and, and go from there. And then she'll go out and forage. Have you watched a mom do this for the first time? Is there oh, yeah. a learning curve for that little? How difficult is it for him to learn to nurse? It, it's, I mean, they take to it, I mean, immediately. Um, we've, went, like I said, at the deer pens, you know, we'd be doing our, our pen checks and everything. And and we kind of knew which which mamas were ready to pop pretty soon. Um, so we were a little extra careful and, and looking, see if she was deflated and uh uh on occasion we would catch the rare opportunity of, of watching her give birth and and that whole process and it's, it's uh pretty cool but i mean that that fawn i mean instincts take over you know and uh, if you've ever seen a uh, most people have not seen this but a, a fawn as soon as it'll born as it's born if that doe snorts it'll just immediately hit the ground huh. uh, just a defense mechanism it, it's pretty cool how the the instincts taking it take over with uh, white-tailed deer. So I know in, we've had everybody talk about don't touch them. Um, but there is, a, there is a number, and I don't know what it is. I won't let you tell us again. If they've been abandoned for a certain amount of time, and I don't know if it's 24, 48, or whatever hours, if they, they're still in the same spot and nothing, they, she hadn't come back, then she, what is that number generally? Um we we really don't get that a lot so i, I don't even know uh, if i have a number to give you okay. there toxie but uh i was mo- told that by a deer guy one time about that and actually they there are some licensed uh, rehabilitator people that you cannot by law touch them or do anything but if you it was a number and i can't remember the number if it's been abandoned for that long call them and they could legally come get it if they're licensed to but that was the only thing you could do and we have a list of licensed rehabilitators at our jackson office uh that that you can call um but but definitely the the best thing to do is just kind of just leave them alone don't don't touch it don't touch it so how old are they when mama they start walking around with mom uh, typically, at a, they they start following mama around a lot more around eight weeks old. You know, um, ten by ten weeks, I mean, just pretty much following around just about everywhere at, at that point. Um, but like I said, I mean, as as soon as they're born, every time she's nursing them, she's uh, she's walking them to a n- new place, so it, it's pretty immediate. And she's so on the move, mm-hmm. and they nurse and just lay back down. That's right. Yep. 
That is just it so, is amazing. So, and they are the cutest things. Oh, oh they are. Yeah. I mean, it is. You got to tell Biden not to pick them up because that's when you see them. That's the first thing you want to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. No. Hug them and kiss them. They're so cute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think, I mean, it's I, incredible. I think it's illegal to, to try to raise a deer that you. It is. It is it's definitely illegal to try yeah. to uh, raise any wildlife, mm-hmm. you know, um, unless you're a licensed rehabilitator. Yeah. So. And they have to pass. You know, they have to know what they're doing or they can't get their license. That's right. But, I mean, so. you know, that that fawn really needs to be able to survive. She needs a lot of those uh, antibodies in the milk, you know, especially those first eight weeks uh, to survive, you know. And that's the colostrum we, mm-hmm. you hear about. Colostrum. colostrum. That's right. Yeah. Hey, look yeah. at you. There you go. Wow. You got it. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah I just worry here. about them when they, they might drop them and have them in. And it's not shaded, and it you know we get these hundred degree days back to back to back. Mm-hmm. That's where I, sometimes I worry that I guess they'll get them up, move them, put them in the shade, maybe. Mm-hmm. Are there exactly. are there ever problems like, and we'll move on to a mature deer after this, but <laughs> are there like if you know some old farm's got a hog wire fence or something up, and Mama can get over it, but the fawn can't, or some kind of are there mm-hmm. structures like that that cause problems ever? Absolutely, yeah, especially the. Uh, like the sheep wire or, you know, um, the, the cattle fencing, you know, with the, with the tighter wire, you know, most, most of the time they can get through, you know, those, uh, four to six inch squares, but anything smaller than that, um, makes it a lot more difficult. If you do want to move it, you know, if you got woods on the other side of that fence and you want to just move it over that, that doe will not abandon that fawn just cause you, you've touched it. Uh, she will come back. Um, and I mean, she's more concerned about, that fawn than than you touching that fawn mm, for yeah. sure you know yeah boy they 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 must be great mothers because they there's when you see them and you, they're mm-hmm. nursing and they're just there's just i don't know there's something <laughs> special about that well look so, how much some how, are. look how fast they populate somewhere you know so oh, yeah the yeah. biggest detriment to them is a high density of coyotes mm-hmm. from what i've learned they, yeah, I mean, they just wipe them out when the coyotes are dense yep one more thing on the on the phone. I've always heard that if you're you're seeing twins, mm-hmm. that uh, that's an indicator of your deer herd health. Absolutely, is, that is a yeah. If if you're seeing a doe w- without a fawn or um or with just a single fawn, typically a younger uh, doe, like a one year old doe that gets bred, she's only gonna have a single one. But uh, I mean, they can have up to four. I mean, they've got four nipples. They can have up to four. Triplets are very rare. Uh, it's a lot more rare when they have, you know, more than twins just because uh, competition for nutrients mm-hmm. and resources. And usually the there's one smaller or something like that. But but twins in, are very common in a, in a very good habitat, you know, good, well-managed properties and stuff like that. Um, you, you should be seeing twins. Ah, cool. Yep. A few years ago, Toxie rode up on a on a phone on his four wheeler. Almost doing something. ran over it. I was going across one of our duck ponds and there's one we couldn't plant and so it's grown up a foot to three foot tall and stuff. And I was riding a four wheeler across it and I was really looking around to see what kind of native vegetation was there, whether I could maybe plant something, you know, disc and plant or or, you know, spray what's there for the broad leaves and, you know, was there enough, you know, whatever, barnyard grass, brangle top, some of those uh good grasses and i was just looking at that and all of a sudden literally i stood that four-wheeler straight up almost flipped it <laughs> squeezing that handbrake and because i could see that phone and i almost hit it it was mm-hmm. a foot from the front bumper and yeah. of course it immediately started going meh, meh, and i just pulled my phone out and of course iphones and videoed it a little bit well they it's the most watched thing we've ever posted in yeah, the company it, it wasn't <laughs> like the clearest image or anything but it Everything else was awesome. The, the I'll tell you what, I would, I'll would contend that a little got, bit because being a phone, I thought in the sun was just right. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty amazing. But oh, yeah. it it got it was obviously good because it got shared oh, over and over. Millions and, over. and millions and millions of times. But I was just so close like that. Yeah. And then, you know, I never saw mom anywhere and I backed up real slow and made a big wide berth around it. And I did, you know, I could see my track. So I came back through maybe 30 minutes later just – you know, curiosity is gone. I couldn't find him anywhere. It's so, easy to happen. So mama would have heard that bleep. Oh, yeah. She, she, she was she, in there she, watching me, I guarantee you. Because oh, yeah. this is, a, you know, 20-something acres worth of just grown-up grass, no trees or anything. So mm-hmm. she was right there watching somewhere. 
it, it's easy uh, to miss them too. Like we, when we were searching the research pens at MSU, we would usually have uh, a technician on the front of the side by side and one in the back looking. And there were some times where we'd be right up on them and, and almost run, run them over. Um, yeah, bush hogging is really bad. Yeah, don't this get time of year. August no. 15th, you need to wait a couple more weeks. Yeah, at least. How long, I mean, you tell me in Mississippi, how long would you wait? Yeah, so, so we have a map on our website, um, and I, I've posted that map before. It, it shows the peak spawning times is based on you know peak rut and everything but uh typically mid-july for most of the state is when they're dropping right so typically about eight eight to ten weeks after so you that, say an eight week old will get up and run instead of sitting there to get oh hit. yeah yeah absolutely yeah. okay yeah so we need to wait eight weeks so we really need to wait till september 15th then. well or first of september anyway yeah, first of yeah, september t- first september for for most people and uh you fine. know i might be wrong here but it's it's not just about running over a fawn it's taking away their safe haven mm-hmm. so That's you right. you right. go and clip all your old fields that are three mm-hmm. four foot thick then where are they going to go mm-hmm. they're going to have to go by some nearby like closed canopy hardwoods or pines where they're going to be a lot more vulnerable to mm-hmm. a coyote finding them or so mm-hmm. that, there's been a lot of research done the relationship with fawns and coyotes for for decades now you go to like the southeast deer study group meeting there's always multiple sessions on on research with that and and it's a common thing you know coyotes or predators in general they will eat fawns especially when they're younger that first eight to ten weeks you know that they, they're going to get hammered a lot more um and it's very hard to trap out uh, the big predators like coyotes because they can just go so far. Yeah. But all the research that have, has looked at habitat management as, as a mitigating factor uh, to, to, keep, um, to keep fawns from being predated has always showed big gains. So, so basically like diet studies and stuff uh, where they didn't do a lot of habitat work and they did, they did habitat work the the coyote diets were a lot lower in fawns and mm. a lot more in like mice and rats and rabbits and things like that and and the fawn recruitment rates were always way way higher when you had good habitat so, so let me guess early successional absolute boom same huh, absolute. thing same, thing, same yeah. exact thing as grazing poles yep right. yeah. yep hmm. yep absolutely my last question on fawns just curious sure. last few days We've been getting, it's just raining all day long, all night long. Mm-hmm. If fawns are being born right now, is that hard on them? That- not really. Not like it is on turkeys and turkey poults and stuff like that. Um, it's, fawn- cold, it's colder then, it's cooler. I yeah. think they're more susceptible to maybe viruses or colds or stuff like that. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You know. um, it, it's, you know, at least not in the South. Uh, it's n- probably not much of an issue. You know, they did a study up in, I think it was New Hampshire, um, where they were, they have an area where uh, almost devoid of predators, you know, hardly any bobcats, coyotes, anything. And they were showing pretty high, um, you know, fawn mortality during the summer, even without predators. Wow. Um, Due to what? Due uh, diseases and, and things like that and, and malnutrition. Right, and, right. Uh, all, there's, I mean, they had a list of, of all these other things that were, they were potential causes of death that were not predators. So, it's a hard life for a fawn, you know, but but when you do have predators, you do the habitat management where they can get somewhere and hide, they're going to be a lot better off. Hmm. That's okay. I mean, I heard him talking when he said habitat. The longer I listened, I was going, you know, there's same thing, second verse. <laughs> what we hear from all the great turkey biologists, mm-hmm. too. That's right. Yep. Spare the bush hog spoil the child or however you want to say that you know <laughs> how does that go lanny i think the way he said it yeah, <laughs> yeah. spoil yeah. the fawn that's, in the pole i guess that's the right. best way to put it dudley you want to fire <clears throat> the yeah, first question I, I have a feeling that we're going to hit on the same stuff we've been talking about but but my question is uh what is so you go out and look at all these private landowners' properties and, and make suggestions for them. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure a lot of the stuff you're doing here in Mississippi uh, is going to be similar. Gosh, uh, the, the plant species may be a little bit different, but a lot of these things, you know, can be used even way up north. That's right. But uh, what is typically the most obvious lowest hole in the bucket 
you see when you go see a property? What's the most obvious thing that's negative towards deer? Towards deer? Yeah. So typically, uh, the main thing is, is, and it, it, it depends. You know, yeah. <laughs> so you know, I'm, I'm from the school you, of depends. You, you trained under who over there? Yeah, Demaris, Demaris and, yeah. And, and and I know Bronson. Yes, really Bronson. Is Bronson, Bronson is you know, two, two words. It depends. Depends. He is the Mister Depends. Uh, so so, <laughs> but that is the first thing we're looking at is well, one, what is the goal of the property, mm-hmm. and then two, what is the limiting factor to that is keeping them from reaching that goal? That's yeah, that's for, for deer or whatever. Um, Typically, it's, it's going to be some type of habitat-related thing, you know, um, not wanting to cut the trees because they want big trees. And, and uh, you know, for a deer, you know, it's all about um, really food and cover. You, you know, if you want to attract and hold a lot of deer on your property, they need, you know, two main things, food and cover. And deer eat a lot of food, you know, a lot of vegetation, and they can eat a, hundreds of different plants in a day, but they really prioritize the higher quality stuff first, you know? And so like, give you an example, hundred pound fawn within a year will eat about one ton of vegetation wow. by herself. 200 pound buck, double that, two tons a year of vegetation. You, you try to go out and pick enough leaves and leaves of good plants, you know, throughout a year, that that are good quality stuff so so we're looking out there and and like if it's a closed canopy pine stand or closed canopy timber stand and that's all they have we know okay you probably got only about 50 to 100 pounds per acre a year in native deer food being produced Mm -hmm. we select cut some stuff get a, a forester in here get his opinion open up the canopy it can go from 50 to 400, you know, mm. add in some clear cuts, 8,000, uh, 8,000 or 800 to 1200, you know, pounds per acre. So, so food there could just by putting light on the ground, uh, could make a big difference. And then here in the South, that food is also cover, you know, um, you know, a lot of people, people say, well, well, I've got a lot of food plots, you know, which, which can, can be good, you know, mm. but it's supplemental, mm-hmm. right? And that's only part of their diet. You know, we what we don't plant for is the other part of their diet. You know, the browse, the woody stuff, you know, greenbrier, blackberry, you know, woody vine type things. That can be on average, you know, 35 to 45% of their diet in late winter. You know, when there's not a lot of plants, native plants, it can be as high as 70 to 80% that is is native browse. And that that's also creating cover, you know, that type of stuff. And so, um, if you, if you want to have more deer, you want to have better deer, you have to have more food, good cover, um, and better food. And then also not have uh, a population too high. If you can manage the population to where all the best food is eaten up and they're stair stepping it down to the lower quality stuff. Good deal. You know, it it kind of tied back to when you talk about those. Bronson has sat there and, and he amazed me one time when he said that a, a, a doe with two fawns needed 20,000 calories a day. Mm. Oh, yeah. I, I just I try to wrap my mind around how much forage that must be. Yeah, and, and a high protein forage. So, so I believe uh, their protein requirements go up eightfold or 800 um, percent when they have when they have fawns just in in general. Mm. So they're they're consuming a lot more and then they they need good quality to be able to produce that milk and and keep those fawns healthy as well. See these people? When the clock strikes five, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. They have to do these things. They have to do those things. Enter the all new LS Tractor MT2 and MT2E, a relentless force of innovation, redesigned with a new hood and cab built for comfort and visibility, with enhanced lifting capacity to get the job done. Making these people the ones everyone else calls those people. Visit your local LS Tractor dealer today. Moultrie has pioneered the game management category. Today, Moultrie is one of the best-selling brands of feeders and seeders in the world, and they continue to innovate with new technology that gamekeepers will rely on. Moultrie products are always field-tested and designed for hunters by hunters, combining forward-thinking innovation with time-tested practicality. Moultrie, first in feeders since 1979. 
All right, so guys, Moultrie is offering our listeners a 15% site-wide discount at MoultriefEeders.com. Use code Mossy Oak with a capital M, Mossy Oak, at MoultrieFeeders.com and get that 15% discount. Go back in time a week, and it was so dry here. Mm-hmm. As a biologist, would you have been concerned about succulent vegetation for a pregnant doe at that point? Not... Uh... If it was prolonged, you know, um, those plants aren't going to senesce just really quickly. A lot of them are deep rooted, you know, native vegetation, you know, especially here in the south. They're they're typically used to drier conditions um, at some point. But as the summer goes on and like take last year, for example, in in Mississippi, it was one of the driest Mm -hmm. uh, late summer periods we've had, you know, in almost 100 years in Mississippi. And, uh, and, and we've seen that in like our DMAT, our deer management assistant program data, um, lactation was, was lower because there was less fawn. So, so the fawn crop probably got hit pretty hard. Um, of course we, a lot of research in South Texas, I did my master's degree down in South Texas. That, that was a big factor. If it was, if it was a rainy summer, uh, when those fawns were hitting the ground, you're going to have a lot of fawns. If it was dry, you weren't, you Hmm. know. Um, that that isn't as big of a factor here in the the eastern portion of the United States, but it can be. You know, you go back to uh, uh, 2015, 2016 in Mississippi, it was two drought years, um, and we've seen the the number and quality in the data we have, uh, the the number and quality of deer uh, were diminished uh, if they were born in those years. So the fawns born in those years, there were less of them. And then they were smaller too, you know, um, and that goes, I mean, like at Mississippi state, you know, they did that, uh, genetic environmental genetics study where they showed that it takes generations to affect, um, uh, the nutrition of, of, um, of, of the deer, you know, if they're pulling them from the coast, you know, after two generations, those deer can grow just as well as the deer from the Delta. Hmm. Um, but depending on the conditions they're born in, kind of, that, that holds, uh, that affects them the rest of their life, really, you know. Hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say, he just hit it. It's so overlooked, I think, that, and I've learned, the early life nutrition probably plays the biggest part in the potential of that animal. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people, let's just say, you know, not to knock anybody selling seed to people, it's important. But you plant something super nutritious this summer, or even, you know, go buy some kind of super great, you know, nutritious pelleted ration. That's terrific feed and expect immediate results. I mean, obviously it'll help some, but until the biggest thing is, and I guess that window of time in the summer is critically important because you are, you know, they're growing their antlers and finishing, finish them up. That's when they grow the most, but also the more important was the nutrition of the doe mm-hmm. and then the fall. Besides, that gives that's really the only thing gives them permission and continue that through life to really express what's there. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's the thing that is overlooked is everybody wants immediate, you know, right? Gra- uh, immediate gratification. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In deer, pour a medical on the round, you know, do this, do that. We'll grow bigger deer right away. And then they're disappointed when it doesn't happen. Well, it takes a long time ago, I remember hunting in a place that had just incredible deer. And I was like, how did this happen? He said, is it nutritional? Is it genetic? He said, well, it's both. But let me just say, the best way to get great genetics is years and years and years of great nutrition. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow. That was like 30 years ago I heard that. And Mm -hmm. everything I hear from everybody, you know, deer management people, you know, it still rings true. So what I was going to ask him is, and and, uh, clearly from everybody, the the way you manage the entirety of the property trumps anything you plant or anything you feed them yourself and the word habitat is such a broad term Mm -hmm. two obviously number one sunlight hits its ground that's an old saying we all use for anything good to happen but what are some of the ways to further because you're limited to what's there or are you not or what how do you bring to bear the best that your place has okay You've, you've revealed it with sunlight. Do you, can you spray, burn, disturb it through disking or chiseling or something or 
actually maybe even reintroduce certain plants. Talk about that a little bit, how I could take the place and make it the best it can be beyond just mm -hmm. revealing it with sunlight. Yeah. The answer is yes. <laughs> All of the above. Uh, you know, whatever you can do. I mean, when, when we survey our landowners, I mean, the number one limiting factor is time. So a lot of what we're trying to do as wildlife consultants with them for the state is is trying to make them be as efficient as possible to do to get to whatever goal they have and and everyone's going to have a different situation I've, I've been on hundreds and hundreds of different properties every single property has been different um, in some way or the other some of the recommendations are the same but the all overall recipe is often you know different um, so depending on what they have you know if, if you do some type of disturbance uh, you want to make sure it's not just a one hit deal. You know, you want to continue with that. Mm -hmm. When I say disturbance, you know, pres you mentioned prescribed fire. Um, if, if you get light on the ground, you know, you want to maintain that by, by uh, disturbing that understory, you know, with something like prescribed fire. Um, maybe you do need some herbicide, you know, depending on if you have a, a heavy woody mid story and they're, they're too big, you know, for a fire to really kill it. So, so it all really depends, um, but but management in general is uh, diversity for any species really is is the key. And uh, to kind of go back to the the conversation we were just having, you know, we just had that that record drought this last year. I have noticed in the data with a lot of properties I've worked with where their lactation or their whether they're having a good fawn survival or not on the properties that are doing better habitat management they're they're have better understory they're doing timber management maybe they're doing adding in summer food plots as well those places seem to be less affected so so that habitat management is also mitigating under these these conditions that we can't control for you know if it's going to be a drought it's going to be a drought but that that deer population is going to be a, in a lot worse situation way worse situation um if if they're just they just have the bare minimum mm -hmm. that makes sense oh totally yeah yeah well so as a biologist when you travel the state and, and you know and I'm, I'm trying to think about the whole southeast and, sure. and on up from yeah. the north but what 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 are you seeing that guys are doing right now that and you're like yep that's that's catching on that we're making some progress here yeah i mean the the first thing i think is just just trying to get as much information as possible you know trying to find someone like most most states are going to have some type of private lands uh, technical guidance available to them so so a program that helps to provide them information for wildlife management in some way so just just getting someone to to help you and guide you and making that plan is a good start um we we also have the deer management assistance program so collecting data you know i think there's one say I, I don't know who's who said this some management quote but you can't manage what you don't measure you know so if you're keeping track of what's going on uh like through uh collecting body weights and and uh, taking the jawbone out and and comparing uh data like that or lactation you really don't know if what you're doing is working or not i've, I've been to a lot of properties where they were doing a lot of active management but it was kind of random there was no goal in mind they were just Oh, I heard this is good to do, or this is good to do, but they weren't thinking of the end goal in mind. They weren't. They were just thinking of this year, this next season, and not five or ten years down the road. And so, where we come in, we help kind of guide them along and 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 help them define uh, what that plan needs to be to reach that goal, that long term goal. So, the first thing I would say is is get some information, make a plan. Uh, find out what your limiting factors are, and then go from there. Are we shooting enough does? No. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't feel like some it's places much of a priority as it depends, used to be. Bobby. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it depends. <laughs> so I, I would say, you know, if you look at the data, you know, and uh, for our state, um, and even just nationwide, like with uh, what uh, the National Deer Association puts out with with collecting that data from all the states. Um, you know, deer populations went up, you know, and, 
and a lot of people, you know, got deer management fatigue, you know, the last few decades. Mm, you know, that's an interesting yeah, phrase. I get it. I understand yeah. where it's coming from. Though. I, I can't take credit for that. That was Kip Adams. Okay. You know, yeah. uh, uh, yep. Said that. Kip. But, uh, but, you know, and so instead of, you know, the, a lot of places, they got the, the population, you know, in a good place. Some didn't. Some did. Some went too far, you know. Um, and instead of uh, maintaining the population in a lot of places, they either backed off too much or, or, or uh, didn't, didn't do enough. And so, so nowadays, um, not just in Mississippi, but really nationwide, there's, there's a lot more spotty high populations and low populations and a lot of other places that are doing, you know, just fine. But uh, I work mostly in central Mississippi, and I can guarantee you there's a lot of places with way too many deer uh, in central Mississippi. And, and I know that's, uh, that's the case for a lot of places throughout our nation as well. Don't you think it's probably a little safer to be a little over, a little over harvest than under harvest? I do. Uh, from, from what I've seen, you know, with a lot of the properties I've worked with, man, it's, it's hard to, um, for, for most places, to over harvest um it can happen and i've seen it happen yeah. um but I, I like to use the analogy you know trying to manage a uh a, a doe population specifically doe since they're driving the population it's almost like uh hitting a spring with a hammer the harder you hit it the harder it tries to jump back hmm. you know um again that's not always the case there are some places where uh especially with, you know, the way the timber market is now, you know, large areas with, with just very poor habitat and it's very hard to get any good habitat management done through, through uh, timber harvest and things like that, that um, they can't handle, you know, as, as hard of a, uh, a harvest. And it's, it's kind of hard when you meet with a lot of places that are like that because you go, for example, go into a property and, and you're, you're looking at uh, the habitat and they just have very little understory and cedar trees look like lollipops because they've just, the deer have just eaten up to, you know, uh, shoulder high. Wow. And, and you, you tell them like, hey, look at this. They don't have much food. They're eating stuff they don't like that, that's hard to digest. That's very poor for them. You know, you got too many deer. And when we say too many deer, that's relative to how much food is available. Right. Mm -hmm. Because the first thing a lot of them will say is, well, we don't see many deer. We don't have many deer. And they probably don't, but they still have more than the habitat can sustain. And when, I don't want to use, you know, terms that are uh, too technical for the audience, but, you know, carrying capacity is is just how, how many deer a habitat uh, or an area can can sustain you know if it if it hits that point that's as many deer as you you have the problem is when it hits that point the habitat starts to then degrade yeah. so if you're not shooting enough and you know you think oh, i'm gonna shoot less and the population is going to go up so i can have more well it can only go up so high and when it gets that high it's going to degrade the population or that degrade the habitat down so you're going to have less deer by shooting less deer. It's kind of counterintuitive and it's hard mm. to explain to people that way. But when when they they've eaten all the best stuff, it takes a long time for that that vegetation, the best vegetation to recover. I mean, years and years to recover. And so in that time, you know, just because you let off uh, shooting the number of does, um, you're you know, you might go five years and have less deer because you, you shot less because they've degraded. You, they don't have as, as much food. They don't have as much cover. They don't have uh, the ideal situations to grow anymore. So they may be having more, less, fewer twins. Fewer twins or, or none at all because, I mean, they're ma they've already maxed out the number of mouths that, that that ground can support. Will they start leaving at that point? I mean, uh, typically not. So, so does in general are homebodies. When you see a doe group, a lot of them are related, you know, sisters, aunts, you know, cousins, you know, uh, and things like that. So they're, they're homebodies. They don't disperse like, like the bucks do. So they're going to kind of stay there. And the way they, what happens as far as population regulation goes is they're just going to have less fawns, you know? And so, um, you may see a, a population that just gets really old, um, to where they're not having as many fawns um, because that's 
they've already maxed out as as many as they can have on the property so they just can't add any more right um to where if if especially when we get into like you know a lot of people are interested in buck management you know so so there's this term called maximum sustained yield which is just meaning if you push the population down more production will increase so less deer healthier does they're gonna have more fawns more fawns mean more bucks that's increasing production at that point um so if you know you have a lot of bucks um you know on the place and and you want high turnover the higher the turnover the the better the chances of that uh that buck that's in the one percent you know uh, being born on your place uh i, I know that's hmm. all pretty pretty technical stuff i'm yeah. sorry it's so. just we pretty like pretty the technical stuff. it's really all <laughs> common sense, sense. Right? yeah really yeah every bit sense. of it even the complex stuff is totally common sense and talk the other thing that we i think people maybe miss this too that i've learned is is there's that that balance you're seeking balance as much as anything and you know depending on the the, the type of some plants and how nutritious the soil nutrients are and all determines your carrying capacity you know and the, the amount right. of sunlight hits the ground to grow all that but then you know there's a there's a balance between your population and the carrying capacity and i would you know it's even the best of us couldn't tell people exactly what that is but mm -hmm. relatively speaking if you could somehow at even come close to understanding it and keep your population below the carrying capacity. Don't mm -hmm. push the envelope. But the other thing that I was going to get to that it doesn't get talked about is the, the balance of the doe to buck ratio. That's another mm -hmm. balance that's kind of, I don't know if that's always thought about or not. And I know that today things are much better than when I was a kid. That's mm -hmm. a long time ago. Uh, and when we were just shooting every buck and shooting mm -hmm. no does, it was terrible. But I do see remnants across the South that that still is is really out of balance. Yeah, I mean, there there are some places, I mean, even the last couple of years, some properties I've worked with, you know, that uh, they did a camera survey and they had, you know, maybe three does to every buck. And that, you know, you want close to one to one and, th and that's relative. Yeah, that's know. hard to get, actually. Uh, it's it, very hard to get. And, and you know, it, it's more... The ratio is not as important. It's more of a symptom of of the cause, right? So typically, you know, you're not shooting enough does. You are still shooting bucks, and you just have more does than you have bucks. What's really more important is is how many uh, deer are there relative to the amount of food that right. that's available. So so the ratio, you know, that that's more like I said, a, a, a symptom. And when we do see, you know, two does or three does to every buck, we just that's a, a indicator so to speak of okay doe harvest just didn't hadn't been high enough in this right. this area um so one thing we like to do um and, and i know we talked about it before the show with the with the browse survey so like late summer late winter one thing as biologists we like to do is look at what the deer are eating and what they're not eating like the example with with the cedar we don't want to see them eating cedar there's problems when they're eating cedar um, we want there to be a surplus in these what we call stress periods, late summer, late winter, these stress periods for the deer when there's uh, less quality food available, less food available in general. We want there to be some meat on the bone, so to speak, of the best quality plants. We don't want to see just all the best plants eat completely up and they're eating medium, low quality stuff. We want there to be a surplus when you have a uh, some of those good plants left available at the end of those periods, um, that's a good indicator that, that things are um, going good and they're getting all that they need and you don't have too many of them in an area. True or false, if you see rabbits on your place, you got, you got pretty good deer habitat. Tip, yes. I, I would say true just because rabbits, they, they need a lot of the understory vegetation, um, from a cover standpoint and a food standpoint, all that is that is good for rabbits is good good for deer. You know, from a deer standpoint. Um, so yes, I would. That's absolutely true. Do rabbits cycle every seven years? Is that a, is that a myth, or, or as a biologist, can you help lay some? That I don't know. Uh, have you heard that toxic? That I have heard that. that I don't know. I've heard the raccoons are seven years. Yeah. yeah, and I've heard that rabbits cycle, but I don't know exactly what the disease is or 
what the years are. Did they not teach you that at Mississippi State? <laughs> I'm going to stay in my lane on that. He's a deer guy. I, 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 stay I'm in your deer, lane, dude. Yeah, I'm more of a deer and turkey guy. I, I'm not going to I'm not gonna just stand here and uh, and try to lie to y'all. <laughs> Lady, you got a question? Yeah, I know. Working, um, you know, we, we've been talking about, well, I guess a rule of thumb that we have been using around here, and, and I don't even know if it's a good rule of thumb or not, but kind of back to what Toxie was saying uh, about the requirements of the does and the fawns early on. We've kind of said that hey, if you can provide an average of at forage with an average of sixteen percent protein, that will allow the fawns to express their genetic potential early in life. Is that a decent rule of thumb? That that is a fact that based on research. There you yes. well, look at Thank there. Thank you, Mister Know It All. <laughs> wow, it wasn't Good my job, research. Lenny. Yeah. yeah, I obviously grabbed it from somebody else. I, I know they done. They did some work on that uh, down in South Texas uh, with with some research, and I think uh, MSU's done some stuff on it as well. But so that's the magic number. 16 to 17% is kind of that. If, if food is above that uh, threshold in protein uh, when they need it, that, that's going to give them everything they need. Well, think about it, though. That, that's not just a let's try to maintain that 12 months out of the year. You've actually got to have a surge in it especially in the summer yeah. period because you we just talked about the doe needing two three four times yeah, as a much ton of forage. to get the the phones for her and the phones to be to get off onto a good start it's kind of like growing a big buck is you got to have a good foundation mm-hmm. to build a house mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. so i'm just thinking why it's so important for us the 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 real dark spot in these quote-unquote food plot manager people is the late summer stuff mm-hmm. uh largely filled in the gap in our part of the world by soy, the good old soybean. There's mm-hmm. really not much better in that period, but it's harder and harder to come by because of the deer densities and people planting less and stuff like yeah. that. So God. I'm just saying when you can I just like a, a really, really good clover in good conditions that lasts 12 months out of the year, but then some of the peas that we offer. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. some of those things are critically important, and you might not see results in one year like – you know, I planted it, and deer came there this summer, and then that hunting season we killed no, that deer. Yeah. But it is it just just to if you're a twelve month out of your mindset gamekeeper, think about you do need to prepare for something extra. Whether you've done it through the way you manipulate habitat, which is pretty complex sometimes, yeah. or mm-hmm. you plant something that say to peak out in production like June, mid June through. Late August, late August. would That's be right. really important. Yeah, you know, obviously uh, protein requirements are a lot higher, you know, in the summertime. You know, bucks grow on their antlers, does have their fawns. Protein's going to be, you know, very important um, as well. You mentioned, you know, soybeans are good, uh, high quality, you know, native common ragweed, you know, is a, a native plant, has, has just as much, or provides, I, w- I should say, as much protein as like a soybean does because they can, I mean, a deer can only process, you know, 17% of it. So whether it has, you know, common ragweed has 20% and, and soybeans have 32%, they're getting the maximum number of protein they need anyway. Right. Hey, this is Toxie Hayes with Mossy Oak. You know, hunting and fishing, gamekeeping, and taking care of the land with my family is my life. And I'll be honest with you, the one app that I'm on every day and use more than anything is Onyx. It literally has changed my life. From property ownership to roads, everything to do with understanding the land better. I even use it to plot acreages all the time. Every function I could dream of. Use coupon code Mossy Oak to save 20% on your next Onyx subscription. Trust me, you'll be so glad you did. Do you think if a deer eats the soybeans at 28 or 30, but then some of the other rough diet is only like eight or something like that. Can they still balance that entire stomach full or is it only yeah, so 16% th- of the beans? So that gets pretty complicated too. Cause the, you know, I don't want to get too far in the weeds on this, but as a white tailed deer being a ruminant, um, they're on the spectrum of ruminants opposite of like cattle. So they need a lot of browse too. And there's been a lot that shown that, you know, without that good native browse, that's, Again, like we said earlier, that's half of their diet. They're going to be eating that with the soybeans there, you know, or or not. Um, but 
they're not going to be able to process that high protein food if the other half of their diet is poor quality native vegetation. So like their uh, microbiome type. Mm-hmm. Huh. So, so they can. So if if you get provide good high protein uh, food, whether it's native food or through food plots like clover or soybeans, or my favorite, you know, food plot for the summer in Central Mississippi's American Joint Fetch. That's mm-hmm. that's go. my go to. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, you know. For them to get as much of it out uh, as as possible, the other half of their diet also has to be good, and that's going to be you know having things like dewberry and greenbrier and and those higher quality uh, browse plants that that they're eating as well throughout the day. That's very interesting. I know to us sitting at this table that you say that you know while cattle and deer are both ruminants they have dramatically different dramatically yeah. different I, I mean a a uh, a deer you know cattle mainly eat grasses right uh, a deer cannot survive on grasses I, I i don't you know there were there are situations i'll just go ahead and mention it. so when we had the south delta flood you know in in 2019 there was uh some some deer getting pushed up on those levees and all mm-hmm. they had you know, they were managed for cows on those levees and all they had was grass. We were uh, literally having MSU uh, vets going with us, uh, documenting what was in the in the stomachs of these deer. And it was all grass and they were starving to death. Yep. With full, Even belly. with full were, bellies. Yeah. So they were eating like dried up rye grass and Bermuda and Fes- stuff like yeah. that. Fescue, stuff like that. Yeah, a lot, all those things. The yeah. the premise, the but whole we're starving to primary death. number one premise we actually started Biologic so many years ago was exactly that. Mm-hmm. And the first thing we did was important in New Zealand forages that were bred for deer's digestive tract. We found that, you know, mm-hmm. that's exactly what you're talking about. Some of these grasses people plant – are okay when they first germinate in the right. maybe the fall and all, and they're a little you know inch or two tall. And a lot of it is is not is just the they have a tender digestive tract than cattle, mm-hmm. and the cell wall gets so thick on these grasses as they get big and stemmy that they can't digest it anymore. I mean, maybe Absolutely. a little roughage, but they need something different. And so that oat or wheat is really only much good for them for part of the winter. And once it mm-hmm. gets taller, I've even noticed. Um, in really good food plots in in the winter, and I know they'll graze in it some, but when it gets really tall and stemmy, they don't seem to be as attracted to it as when it first comes. No, up. In, unless they're just really really hungry. I mean, I I have seen it where you know they're pulling up some of that bigger stuff, but they they really don't have much to eat. That that's where having something you know mixed in like the clovers, you mm-hmm. know, that's high in protein. You know, during that late late winter stress period, is is going to be a lot better for them. Is there any difference in the way a cow chews its cud? That, that since their stomach's a little bit different, is the is a deer's laying there chewing their cud as yeah. well? Aren't yeah, they? they go lay down. You know, mostly during the day. You know, chewing their cud. You know, just just the same regurgitating that vegetation, chewing it and processing it and swallowing it back down. Uh, so, while we're on the subject. Pierce brought a box of these uh, publications. It's like a little mini field guide that uh, the MDWF and P put out recently. Uh, I think they've been working on it a while, but it's it's pretty hot off the press. But it's called a guide to evaluating browsing pressure by whitetail deer in Mississippi. I would venture to say that this would be good for anybody, probably in the southern half of the U.S. But uh, yeah, most of those plants for this are going to be uh, similar in the southeast, but Definitely people in Mississippi. I mean, you'll see in the book where even different regions of the state, and this is going to be the same, you know, in other states, different parts of the state, deer are going to prefer different plants because there's going to be different plants available um, and things like that, you know, that, that make them choose those over over others. But it's it's a good way. Um, and even, you know, in Mississippi, like I said, great, great tool that we've been working on to put out uh, for Mississippi Game Keepers. Um, but, uh, you know, getting a biologist out to your property, you know, in your state, wherever you are, um, they should be able to, to do the same thing and, mm-hmm. and be able to evaluate the same thing. So we've got a box of these. We'll start as people win prizes and whatnot. We'll include these in there. Is this available in a digital format? So it, got it is, it's, it's on our, uh, website. So, um, you can, you can find a lot of information, uh, 
www.mdwfp.com slash private lands. That's our landing page. Repeat that again because people need to yep. listen and need to go there. Uh, M- w- MD, w- yeah. <laughs> Bobby. <laughs> M- MDWFP.com slash private lands. Uh, and you can go to our webpage. There's a section there that, that says uh, learn more. It takes you to, we, we've we created on our, we have a brand new website and we have a brand new webpage as well. But uh, from our private lands page, we have a, basically a wildlife and habitat management information library where we've put a lot of articles, a lot of videos, a lot of information um, this, this PDF uh, just last week, I, I put it it's at the top on, on one of the first links you see, but for, for any wildlife species, you can go through, pick, uh, deer, turkeys, uh, look at food plots and there's, there's drop down lists of all kind of information. It would, it would take you forever to binge all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've, I've seen it all. Um, but I've, it's taken me a long time to, to look at it. Yeah. Get and, uh, well. uh, Pierce is on social media also, and I uh, I know on Facebook he's always sharing really cool information that, you know, lots of stuff you can go down, you know, click on yeah. it and go down the rabbit hole and learn more. Yeah, no doubt. So, Pierce, one of the things I wanted to learn, from, uh, I, I heard this about you, but you were involved in trapping some deer here in Mississippi. Yeah. How in the world do you trap deer? What was <laughs> what did you learn from all that? Yeah, so it, it was a pretty cool project. Um it was while I was an undergrad at Mississippi State. I was working at the MSU Deer Pens as well under Damaris. And we, we had this uh, project started in Lowndes County looking at, um, we were capturing fawns and one-year-old bucks to, to see if, trying to um, simplify it. But in summary, we were trying to look at and see if, if the smallest quality antlered uh, one-year-olds like the let's say a two-inch spike compared to a six-inch spike compared to like a eight-inch spike or 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 four point if if they grew up to five years old would they still be in those different categories smallest medium and largest categories and so um, as a undergraduate uh, student um, I got the rare opportunity to to help run that project uh, we were capturing deer i think we caught 187 uh, wow. young bucks that's a lot of work how do you catch yeah. how do you catch one uh, so so what we were doing we were uh we had box traps um which uh these big you know six foot long uh uh wooden boxes with drop doors with a with a uh, a string that went through the middle of trigger that when they came in, we would bait bait the inside of the boxes, and when they came in and, and flipped the uh, string, doors came down, and we'd catch them that way. The the other way we were catching them um, were with drop nets. Uh, so we had these uh, big um, 60 by 60 foot nets on, on a pulley system, and had a little uh, drop control device, um, basically some RC remote type type stuff when the deer came under we would you know bait underneath the net when they came under we would hit flip the switch drop them go down there get and, the whole bachelor group yeah yeah and so there, there's a lot better technology now than than when i was doing it uh I'm, I'm i've been pretty jealous of uh some of the the new technology the the students at msu have been able to to use the last yeah. few years but that's how we were doing it um it, it was it was a cool project some of the Definitely the funnest time of my life. Absolutely. What were uh, what were the results out of that? Yeah, so it um, it was a lot more complicated, you know, like like most research. You know, you go in thinking one thing, and then you know it, it, everything's a lot more complicated than you think. But in general, it held true. You know, they they had seen that at MSU Deer Pens and uh, down in South Texas, to where you know the 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 bottom third of that age group pretty much by the time they got to five were still in the bottom third. Mm-hmm. So those can be your, your management bucks. If, if it calls for management bucks, which that gets complicated yes. in itself. <laughs> um, now, now the, the higher quality bucks at one, you know, things could happen. They could get hurt and their antler quality diminishes over time where they move dispersed to a new area with, with uh, less quality, you know, nutrition, um, but those ones in the bottoms never really went, went up. 
typically. Okay. Yeah. So after you captured, and I'm, I'm asking this very specifically because I live right next to Lowndes County. Yeah. And we had a run in with a deer, probably it might've been 10, 12 years ago. Uh, but so once y'all would capture them, what would you do with them? Yeah. So we were capturing them on site. Um, and we were, we were drugging them, um, to work them up, take measurements and everything, put ear tags in them with, with our phone numbers on the back. Mm -hmm. And we would have different colored ear tags for the different years, you know? So we, we did it, uh, four years and we'd have different colors, different numbers as well. If it was a black and white, you know, picture camera and, and, on site, we would we would go and reverse the drug and, and let them go right there. And oftentimes, they'd be back the next day. Sometimes we caught, you know, in the box traps, we'd have the same ones coming back in there. Yeah. You know, and the catch next them day. on private land and just let them go. Private again. land. Yeah, we yeah. had uh, about 20, I want to say it was 25,000 acre cooperative, multiple properties, about 20 properties or so that we were, we were going from. Uh, we would start typically uh, finding sites in October. Uh, they were gracious enough to let us do this during the deer seasons. Um, and we had 24 box traps, four net traps that we'd have running. Um, and then once spring green up started and they weren't coming to the bait good, you know, we'd pack everything up and store it in some barns on wow. site. Yeah. Did you have one in your backyard eating out of your bird yeah. feeder? <laughs> well, I, that's what I was going to ask. And then, I mean, you know, we might, you might cut this out. I don't know. You might leave it in. But uh, we, I live just across the river um, from Lowndes County in mm -hmm. uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Hayden was alive and he's 14, so it had to be within 14 years. Uh, this young buck comes up that had his uh, horns sawzalled off. Uh, he had an hmm. orange collar on uh, and hung out with us for a couple of days. Of course, I tried to keep him around the house as much as I could, feeding him and stuff. And, hmm. and, and when I learned of this, I was like, maybe he was part of that study, but it doesn't sound that like he would That was not have. one of ours. No, we, we kept the antlers on them because yeah. we needed to see them, right. you know. Um, you know, typical, and, and the orange collar. You know, it was a uses, stretchy orange collar. It was, it was wild. Um, because, I mean, they, they had, uh, you know, of course, that was later. I, I don't know. I don't know where they I wonder if someone I mean, illegal. It was, was not one of ours. Somebody yeah. might have illegally raised one. Yeah, that yeah. might have been it, somebody. It, that it, sounds and like And then turned it loose. Oh, well, you know? I, he, he did love the sound of a candy wrapper. You got there, yeah. shh, 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 and boy, he'd come right to you. Yeah, yeah that's going to be. <laughs> yeah, sounds like one of those those fawns got taken home. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yep. right. right. Yeah, it does. I, well, you know well, that, I didn't. I didn't. For the record, I did not try to raise this deer. <laughs> he I, ran off. I bet y'all learned some, and just the process of trying to catch a deer. Yeah, that you probably had to learn. You learned a lot. Yeah the 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 first year was a big learning curve. Um, didn't have a lot to go off of. Uh, in, in fact, that's how I was able to to run it. I, you know, after that first year, I, I wrote a, a a document for Doctor Damaris saying, you know, these are the things that were working, didn't work. Uh, here's what I think we could do better. He he said, okay, you're gonna you're gonna run this thing. Um, and so I, in fact, I, that next year I, I took off a whole year from school to, to do it. Um, wow. and, uh, and we made some modifications and, and we went from, you know, catching very few the first year to, to really, uh, really knocking them out the next three. So when you drive up on a box trap and the plywood has dropped, mm -hmm. you walk, is there a little hole you can walk up and see what's in there? Yeah, we had, we had a little square windows, uh, you know, on a, on a screw where you could look in there, you know, with flashlight to see, you know, what it was, you know, if it was a, a doe or an older buck or something that we didn't want to mess with, you know, we would open the doors and let it run out. Um, but we, uh, another thing uh, I modified, we took some uh, some old netting, drop nets, and made almost like a, a big sock uh, to, to run them into because hi historically they would try to dart them in uh, the box, and that was, that was, uh, chaos. It was pretty, yeah, yeah that, it was exactly. It, it was chaos. So we found out, um, I, you know, I had the idea to, to run them out, get them tangled up, kind of like, how they do in South Texas with the net guns. Yeah. Um, and once they're tangled up, then, then drug them work so much better, um, you know, run them out that way. And then we could, we could release them as, uh, by not putting the net up. So. Wow. That's a lot of deer. Yeah. I was just imagining that at some point you, you're like, I, you may not know what you have in that box. And yeah. really you could have a bear in there as well. Oh, Bobby. Well, you got <laughs> drama, Bob. Uh, there, there could be the, 
I guess the only other non-target. I mean, we caught some. Raccoons. You ever catch any long tail cats? Yeah, <laughs> you know better than that. Uh, we that did pigs. I've got a pig question. going there. Well, that's so good, of course. this area didn't didn't have pig, which was is crazy. So I grew that's up right. hunting that area. Yeah. Um, you know, down in Brooksville from there. You know, a bunch of pigs, but up up where this co op was, mm-hmm. you know. Maybe one pig every couple of years would be on camera, but no pigs, you know, no bears either, you know, in the area. Uh, we we released some some turkeys before. That was a fun explosion, almost like a a, a quail of covey, I you know, uh, scattering. You know, that was that was pretty fun to see them come out. Uh, some bucks. I don't know how they got their antlers in there. Sometimes, I mean, you know, when they're like, sideways. I mean, <laughs> on the camera. You know, that that was another thing we added. Uh, you know, the first year we had a lot of um, problems catching things we didn't want to catch because we were just setting a trigger on everything. And then we started putting trail cameras up. Uh, we didn't have, would love to have had cell cameras at that time, you know, and some of the technology, like I said, the technology that they have now, they can just drop the traps on their phones. But be- but before we didn't. So we had like old, old uh, some of the first cuttybacks and stuff, um, digital cuttybacks. We were setting them up and we, until a fawn was coming in there, we wouldn't set the trigger. Um, Cause it was assumed that the, the buck fawns, which we were trying to catch, you know, just like when they come in the field, they're usually the first ones in the field. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, we assumed that was going to happen. Well, that was not the case. It seemed like, like mama wanted to come in there first until they got used to it. And until we put the cameras on there, we didn't, we didn't know that. And so, so we started uh, putting the cameras on them and only setting it when that buck farm started being the first one coming in there, which happened you, usually takes them uh, a little longer for That's that. That's a lot of work. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of. Uh, I mean, it was fun, but I mean, I, I looking back, I can't believe we put in some of the hours that we did because we would run the string of t- uh, twenty-four box traps during the day and try to get uh, done in time to go sit on a field. Uh, with some night vision, you know, and, and sit on that until sometimes, uh, midnight trying to try to net one. Wow. And we would do that, uh, commitment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we were, we were doing that, you know, once we got everything set up in October, we would often go, uh, from November through February, seven days a week doing that. Um, but we loved it. I mean, we were young and I, mm. I definitely could not do that now, but yeah, it was goodness. a lot of work. The Furminator is the industry's most versatile piece of food plot equipment, allowing plotters to do every step of the process, working the soil, adding seed and soil supplements, and compacting. From start to finish, with a single implement, it's hassle-free by design. Set it for the seed size and simply drive the tractor and the Furminator does the rest. Check it out at TheFurminator.com. Hey guys, Dudley from Gamekeepers here. I want to tell you about the all-new Gunner Dog Bowl. It's designed for home and built for travel. It's customizable, leak-resistant, light on weight, solid on durability, and rust-proof. Like other Gunner products, they're made in Nashville and designed for everywhere. Nosler is known for their bullets, and now they're making suppressors. Nosler suppressors are made for hunting. Adding a Nosler suppressor to your rifle will make you a quieter, more accurate, and more effective hunter. Protect your hearing and disturb less game with a Nosler suppressor. The time to hunt quiet is now. Learn more at Nosler.com. So as a deer biologist, do, do you worry more about EHD or CWD? or What, what worries you? CWD is definitely the biggest concern. Um, you know, and it, if if you're not if you love deer and you're not concerned about CWD, you need to be. Um, it is a complex disease. It it is uh, every time we learn something about CWD, it just seems to just get more complex and worse. EHD, uh, at least in the South, is not much of an issue because it's a virus. You know. A, any virus, an animal can can get antibodies to that. You can't get antibodies to CWD. Deer get CWD. I mean, if something doesn't else doesn't kill it first, CWD will. Um, and EHD, at least in the South, uh, you know, we have some 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 spikes in some years. You know, it'd be worse with different strains coming in and stuff like that. Um, but long term, you know, it's not going to be an issue like cwd is yeah, now, it seems like so. our deer are becoming more and more tolerant yeah 
yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they, and EHC. they have been for EHC, for, and they have been for for a long time. Um, they've done a lot of studies on that. Uh, most of our deer, if you if you pull blood on a lot of our deer, you're going to see the antibodies for all these EHC yeah. uh, viruses in them already, and they're they're doing just fine. Um, that's more of a concern for more Midwest, Northern, where those uh, those latitudes where when they do get AHD, they can have those big outbreaks. Yes. Now, typically, that's just going to be a once and done deal, and it's not going to stay in that population like if CWD gets in it. It's it's there, and it's going to be there for a it's while. It's funny how you go to messing with nature, you're going to ask for trouble. But I remember so many people, um, this great new um, enlightenment about how big the Midwestern deer and northern deer were Canadian whitetails, and they were trying to move them down to the south before mm-hmm. they put regulations on them. They were just dying like crazy. Yeah. They had no immunity That's right. to our, you know, but our, our deer did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they just brought them down here, and they, most of them died from EHD because they yeah. weren't, they didn't have the immunities built up hmm. like that. Yeah, they, so. they did some, uh, MSU did a, a study not too long ago, maybe five or six years ago, where they did a genetic study of Mississippi and some surrounding states as well. And most of the deer uh, genetics are similar to the native deer genetics that were here already. So the other big question really than that is, and I know this is just speculation and you probably may not be comfortable in commenting on it, but you know, recently we've started to read that they think maybe there's a chance that some deer might have obtained immunity to CWD. And so all I'm saying is, do you think there's some hope there or is that the type of thing that might have to end up happening for us to see light at the end of the tunnel? Or do we have no idea? Right now, I I think it's hard to to say either way. There there are definitely deer less susceptible um, to CWD and and that there has not really been a case that maybe one situation in a high fence in uh, Texas uh, that they're doing some research on, um, you know, where, where one buck out of multiple still was living after having a lot of CWD, you know, in that, in that pen. Um, but most of the times when, when you hear about, uh, these deer being immune, they're really not immune. They're just less susceptible. And what that means is they still get CWD. They're still going to die from CWD. It just takes them longer to die from it. Now, you know, if, if, uh, you know, if you have a, uh, you know, a, a place where you have, you know, you want to just get them to older ages, you know, um, that, uh, you know, that can happen. But then, but then you have CWD being spread on the landscape right. for a lot longer period right. as well. Um, so it, it's very complicated. It's just, it's just a mess is what it is. Well, so I mean, at least it gives yeah. us a yeah. thread to pull. Yeah. In this abyss of not knowing what to do, right. from, you know, from a research yeah. standpoint. So if they could actually, you know, at least there's something to put, to go actively research and looking around the country yeah. at places where, you know, you could just kind of like where Dudley and I found hybrid oaks is like, wait a minute, there's nothing in the book that looks <laughs> like that, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you find places that there's no way these deer don't have CWD here. Everything around them has it. Maybe mm-hmm. we find something like that. It just gave me a ray of hope thinking yeah. about it. I mean, uh, I think at some point, you know, I mean, every year we're finding out more and more information. There's there's a lot of research being done, not not just on CWD, but prion diseases in general is yeah. probably the most complicated disease in in like disease studies. You know, with humans, right. animals, and we haven't researched it historically, right? There, you know. and, and there's been a lot more uh, time, money, and research put into to human prion diseases, and it's still not figured out. You know, there yet right. because it's just it's such a complicated, different type. Of, of disease and and problem so so yes i i mean hopefully you know some type of uh you know uh vaccine or something in the future uh they've, they've already tried that a few times i mean they failed um with with the current ones but that that works being done I, I think you know i mean that's just human history we we figure it out eventually sometimes it just takes a really long time and and hopefully we've managed things uh and, and that's what we're looking at right now is is how can we uh, mitigate things and slow things down now to put us in a better situation for if we do get some type of uh, situation in futures, some new research that that gives us that hope that we can we can fight this a lot better. So, are you uh, are you testing all the deer you harvest? 
I do personally. Gotcha. Yeah. I, you know, it, it's one of those things where, you know, it, that's another thing that's complicated. You know, I mean, I'm a wildlife biologist. I don't want to talk is like I said, it's a complicated disease, you know, but I w I don't feel comfortable. I have two little girls and, and my wife, we eat a lot of deer meat every year. Um, and I would not feel comfortable not knowing if that had CWD or not for one. And if it did feeding that to my family mm -hmm. for two, cause there's a lot we just don't know, you know, could it not affect us at all? Sure. But we don't know. Right. And yeah. Cause what you don't know, just in general, all, you know, taking new drugs or whatever it's, you don't know what happens 20 years from now. That's right. right. It may not, it may seem like they never affected humans, but you don't know what yeah. 20 years from now looks and, like. You know, and, and, if you look at other human prion diseases, you know, like uh, oftentimes, you know, we talk about incubation period. That's just, you know, from the time you get the disease to the time it really affects you is the incubation period. For, for a deer, year and a half on average, 18 months or so. Um, but in humans, a lot of those studies uh, on prion diseases in humans have been like 30 to 50 years. You know, that it's incubating before. Which could be why they say it's never infected a human. Right. Right now. Well, yeah. we don't know that. There, I guess. There, and there's a yeah. lot of, there's a lot, a lot of other complicated things. Like, you know, just five years ago, when we talked about CWD, we were talking about CWD as CWD. Now there's some research showing that there's, well, CWD type one, type two, type three, type right. four. Seven different, you know, variations. Well, at least we're learning. Anything. I mean, that's what yeah. 10 years ago, my greatest frustration was we just knew nothing because, you know, there'd never been the money really put into it. Right. And it was a mysterious new thing, you know, on the landscape. Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever had one test positive? That I harvested? Yeah. No, I have not. Gotcha. Yep. So you're, you're obviously you're a smart guy, master's degree and all this. <laughs> Do you, is there somebody... Or, or that you look to and say, this person is really paying attention to CWD. I, I, I'm, I'm paying attention to what he's saying or, or she's saying. Is there, is there yeah, somebody I mean, like that? Uh, the MSU Deer Lab, you know, they're staying at the forefront of, of knowing what's going on. Um, you know, the, we're, as wildlife biologists, whether we agree or not, we're a pretty tight-knit community, you know, especially yeah. in the deer world. You mm -hmm. know, everybody knows everybody. Um uh, MSU, I mean, that, that's definitely on their list. You know, I know Dr. Maris just retired. Bronson's still going, uh, forward. Uh, but that lab is definitely determined, uh, to, to keep doing deer research, to keep putting out the best information on CWD as well. So, so that's one I, I definitely, um, look, look at first. So that's, that's a good lesson from the world of wildlife for the rest of the world is that they've got all these people with differing opinions and they probably don't even get along and whatever, <laughs> but they combine forces and are whatever. They're united because of the resource. Yeah, that's and, right. Yeah, that's I wish right. you could get a pint of their blood and give it to the political landscape out there. Right now. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. Because, you know, yeah. it, nobody, nobody, I don't want to get up on that, but nobody, <laughs> if you don't think, what, if you don't believe what I believe, I don't want to talk to you. I mean, you're stupid <laughs> if you don't believe what I believe. And, you know, there's no cooperation. It's just sad. We could look around in the world and take lessons from it. Not only that, but other places too. Yeah. And it almost seems like the disagreements are what kind of moves it. Yeah, they forward. use that to stimulate new thinking. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely. Because I mean, there's so, still so much we don't know about it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard for any one side of of this topic to say definitively one way or the other. You know, the and and the way the way we look at it is, you know, we want to err on the side of caution, right? Um, because it, it's that important to us. We, we don't want to take this lightly and find out we're wrong because the alternative is, is even worse. Apocalypse. You know? mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. 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 Mm. Let me, let me get my team paying attention here. Pierce. Who's not paying attention? He has brought me. a trivia question. For oh us. no. He's going to try to stump us with a trivia. Oh, and man. here's what we're playing for. Don't so, team. so if he, if he. So do we win one of those, uh, T-shirts. ATN. Yeah. If he four or five. If he if we <laughs> if he does not stump us, the state of Mississippi has given each of us an extra uh, extra buck 
Hey, I love it. <laughs> I, this is I awesome. I did not say that. <laughs> Isn't that I'm what in. we agreed to? I'm gonna get, hold on, let me get my web browser up. I've got to kill the first one. Let me one try to, to remember when I killed my last buck. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's maybe true. five years ago. Let's yeah. turn it over to Richie. Can we get an extra dough? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Mark that time hey, code. If, if you're in DMAP, we have uh, management dough tags and management book tags. There you go. Property, so. You know, we do need to get the place on DMAP. Uh, which I, what, are there any requirements for DMAP? I know, I know we're going to trigger so, questions. So we're big enough. We, yeah. We've we shifted uh, DMAP uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, we got a new uh, data management system. So used to it, you had to have 1,000 acres or, or shoot uh, 10 does. Mm -hmm. We've done away with that. Um, we use it as a tool as needed. So so with our new system, you know, if, uh, if we see we can co-op, say it's 100 acres, and there's uh, a 500 acre property uh, already next to it that yeah. that's working with us. We try to get those Qualified. two properties together, uh, you know, as a DMAP co-op. You know, um, I have, I mean, I have some smaller properties that are shooting over, you know, ten does anyway. The ten doe thing was mainly for a sample size from harvesting the deer and getting that data, but we can now include other data, not just harvest data, observation books, you know, camera survey information other things like that, browse surveys, you know, look, you know, to kind of to gauge what's what's going on. So they're really it and the only requirement is collecting some data for your property, which you're gonna want to do anyway. That's great. And, and that's the requirement. All right. We're in Dudley. Mm -hmm. We definitely broke that 10 dough rule. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that sounds good. All right. So uh, we're gonna turn it over to Richie and let him uh tee up Sheffield. And I hope we get this right. I'm really wanting that Thor scope. Yeah, so Richie, who are we play? Who it, first off, somebody's already won a prize. Who's who has won and what did they win? I want to know how Bobby picked this person here. Uh, War Eagle eighty three. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know how that guy. Wonder got who that is. It's a, yeah, a is that one of your cousins or something? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Is this an insider trading it scheme? Here? It's just could their be, turn to win. It might just be a guy who <laughs> could has be the boat. boat. Yeah, the boat could, nerd. Could be a yeah, boat. It could be a boat guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what it is. Mm. Let's think positive. Certainly. Yeah. So <laughs> they won a companion T shirt. So. Hey, nice. I love. The Toxie's got one on right now. Yeah, he does. Great shirts. Whatever. <laughs> you got you got you got one of, you got one on Dudley's every not a, well not a t shirt three out of four uh, has uh, companions uh, on today so and this isn't the same one I wore yesterday I promise right. so someone's already won the prize so I don't have to go easy on you then no oh you, yes no. you do no, this oh, is, yeah, so they've already won a prize <laughs> I need to go now, easy on now yeah. if you get this prize right what happened, what do we've got we've got for him of course what if we get it wrong easy. he wins or if we yes. get it right he wins well if, if he get if we get it wrong he wins. What if we get it right? He gets a... Uh, and we win an extra buck from the state of Oh, that's right. I forgot. I'm going to take a dose. I'll take two dose. There's going to be so much editing on this. <laughs> All right. So, uh, wins a, a two-pound, half-acre bag of non-typical clover. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. We'll throw in some deer radishes yeah, for you, too. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Today's trivia is brought to you by Sheffield Financial. Fuel your GameKeeper projects with financing for power sports, outdoor power equipment, and trailers. Begin your next conservation adventure at sheffieldfinancial.com. All right, so we are ready. All right, so we, we've talked about a lot of native uh, plants today. Um, and so, so yeah, looking at you, Dudley. So, <laughs> you know, so in, in Mississippi, one of the favorite uh, browse plants for deer is greenbrier, and there's a lot mm -hmm. of species out there. Um, whether you're on the coast or in the hills or in the delta, deer love greenbrier. But there is one species, and I'm looking for the common name, that they don't really like. I'm going to ask my good buddy, Dudley. All right. <laughs> yeah. Is it Jackson Vine? Is it? I'm, I'm just going to say the scientific name. No, he said I, what the, what's the common name is what he asked for, right? I mean, if I, I know the uh, scientific name, if, if that works for you, Quirkus Dudley. Smirkus. Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it Smilax Bonanox? No. Oh. oh, is it what they call Jackson vine? No. Uh, uh, so um, it's lance leaf greenbrier. They don't really like. It's got a leaf, kind of looks like a spear. Huh? Lanny was just fixing to say that, but yeah. you, you yeah, cut him off. I was. I was coming. Yeah, out. You, you were telling me they I'm, love it at your place. I'm so, so, <laughs> so disappointed in myself. That yeah. was a tough one. Well, he yeah. wins some super good clover. And I don't radishes. think he's ever heard of the common name calling it Jackson Vine, I don't think. Because he looked kind of blank when I said Did that you call word. call it Jackson Vine? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. my, my mom calls it that, so she must know. 
Yep. She's the Let's plant see what guru that is. person. Jackson Vine. Jackson Vine. Smilax. Smil- That's it. Lance Leaf. You got it right. Ah. Oh. But, wow. Whoa. We're still going to get you some clover. <laughs> My We're not worthy. We're not worthy. I am there. impressed. I am impressed. Jackson uh, Vine, credit, Lance Leaf Greenbrier. Call credit Miss uh, Evelyn, Evelyn Hayes. Thank no doubt you, about it. Mr. We are, un- we are undefeated. And I, we I are mean, undefeated. We, <laughs> I learned. Tyson no, pulled it out in the night. We, we, lo- we missed one, didn't we? No, but I think we got that right. I okay, think he good. was wrong. Okay. It's like Vandy. My, <laughs> yeah. my son-in-law who's here, he's, he's a know-it-all. Absolutely. Mr. Know-it-all. But they said, have you ever been wrong at all? He said, you know, actually, I was wrong one time, but then I found out later I was wrong about that. Yeah. So, <laughs> I guess that's how we are. All yeah. right. Well, I'm, I learned something. We'll let you go. We'll let you take. We'll Jackson let you leave Vine. home with the prize. Go, boss. Jackson Vine. Yeah. Bring it on. Go. God, pull Dudley, out, just pull call yourself a I'm native embarrassed. guy. Yeah, <laughs> we know who the native man is. Yeah. What guys? What have we learned, Lanny? What you, besides Jackson? I learned Vine? that there's a yeah the green bar that deer don't like, which kind of blew my mind. So. I learned that Pierce Young is a fantastic asset. To our state, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, our He's yeah. still right. trying to get an extra uh, buck, isn't he? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but let's, let's mean, point out. Uh, yeah, what do we see beyond right, the though. obvious is that when you can make a difference in life is when you stick with it. What's the they're talking about now? You know, it's not how many times you get knocked down, how many times you get up, or persistent. Yeah, is more omnipotent or important than you know education or smarts or anything else. And listen to the story about what they went through. To get it accomplished, you know, when with the trapping project. I mean, they went through hell, but they never blinked and just kept with it, even if it was 18 hours a day. Yeah. I think that's important for people to listen to, that sticking with something till you get it done. Tenacity. I, yeah. One thing I can say about my fellow wildlife biologists is, is we're passionate about it. Yeah, because they love that resource. That's, that's it. Right. It unites everybody. Yeah, that's would, right. Would you say a love of white-tailed deer is what led you into this? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I thought you were going to say that you wanted to be on this podcast. Nah. Look, we've got a lot of respect for what you guys do. Oh, my God. Yeah, and and the we really do. No doubt about it. Oh, yeah. yeah. We appreciate what y'all do. I oh, mean, thank you. Absolutely. Well, I, I don't know what we do, but we like we like listening and learning from you guys. And, and yeah. every time somebody comes in here, we, we learn a little something different. That's and, right. And, uh, and we've learned that, that everybody kind of has a little bit different take on, on, on things. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that that's what we do, and that's one thing I, I love about this job is is always learning something new about wildlife management. There's always new research going on, and there's always something new to learn. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, that's we appreciate you coming. It's yeah, just, we I really it. have. Yeah, yeah, thanks for and, being uh, here. But guys, I would encourage you to follow him on Facebook. Yeah, uh, sure. I, I, he, every day there's something. Something you you post something that's really good. Yeah, typically if I get a question from a landowner or something, you know. I'll post something about it. Awesome. That's good. All right. Well, uh, Dudley, have you got anything going on you need to tell us about? Uh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> um, my friend Eric Reinhardt at all, all the other guys there at Daybreak Outdoors, North Delta Outfitters, are having what's called a work weekend. It's going to be a real small, intimate group. Um, Inti- and, ooh, intimate. <laughs> and. We're going to have a lot of fun, but we're going to be serious, and uh, we're going to be learning from some of the best waterfowl managers around. Wow, cool. Um, it's, a, it's a really cool place. Um, so just go to the Daybreak Outdoors Instagram page, and you can find a post about it uh, if you want to join us and, and learn and have a good time. It's going to be uh, August 23rd and 24th, so just go to Daybreak Outdoors and check it out. Huh? What you doing that weekend, Toxie? I might be going to North Delta. Who knows? Or I might be doing the last finishing touches on trying to plant a duck hole. That's what I was expecting yeah, you to say. 100%. L- late August, it's he's like a time. vapor around here. You well, see him yeah, walk starting through. about now. <laughs> Honestly, I keep, it keeps pushing itself back because of, you know, whatever the environment we live in down here. We'll have huge, big decisions we'll need to make. And we're like, where's Toxie? You know, he's yeah. on a tractor in a duck hole somewhere. It, it, on a four-wheeler. We're kicking things rig. off. We're kicking things off now. Yep. Yep. It's yeah. almost here. It is. It'll be here before we know it. Absolutely. Well, Pierce, this has been a lot of fun. Absolutely. Really yeah, enjoyed it. You have to yeah. come back and do this again. We got, I got a, sure. a, a, a little board, and I've got a lot of topics that I think you could touch on and help us out oh, with. Oh, yeah. I so. could talk about this stuff every day. 
for the next week. If just you like want. we do. We with, do every day. <laughs> just like we do with military, we take like to say thank you for your service because yeah, it is it is oh. very close to the same thing. Yep, much appreciated. Pierce, you ever watch our television show Tuesday nights on the Outdoor Channel? I stay pretty busy. You know, Pierce, that's <laughs> yeah. not what I wanted. Uh, uh, no, I, uh, mark that time code. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby loves putting people on the spot with that. So you're not it the only one. It only happens twice a week, so yeah. you're not the yeah. only one. Just, you should, you know, when he was an author, you know, he was, have you ever read my third book? Yeah. Moon yeah. Under. Yeah. All right, guys. Just been fun uh, looking around. Y'all watch the television show if you get a chance. Tuesday nights, Richie works very hard on that thing. Yeah, Tuesday he does. nights on the Outdoor Channel. Go Richie. Yeah, and we sure appreciate everybody listening to the podcast. And with that said, why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Richie. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast, and be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine, and don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.